Today, what we're going to do is we're going to do a thread and rod design problem. Um, it's going to be pretty quick. Um, I think we'll be finished with this like halfway through. Um, and then we're going to start talking about bolted connections. I want to be crystal clear that when I start saying, okay, now we're talking about bolted connections, that's exam two land. This is not going to be on the first exam. The first exam is going to cover the loads and tension members. So homeworks one through three and all the notes up until that point. I don't believe I've posted the bolted connection notes yet, but I'll post them soon because I'm going to post the bolted and the welded connection notes all at once so that, so that you have everything. Um, so it might be a little bit like movie time uh, in that spot. Okay. Now, last time, I, I think we ended our discussion with something that was probably a bit depressing. You know, the Kansas City high collapse and, and the, the people that died that day. Um, I want to talk today a little bit about the mechanics of that, and then we're going to do an example that's somewhat similar to what uh, to that design. So again, whenever you're specking out threaded rods, if your design is anywhere from a quarter inch to one and a quarter inch, specify it in an eighth of an inch increment. So the way that this is going to work is we're going to do some design and we'll get something like, you know, the diameter, the minimum diameter should be 0 0.592 inches. And so take that and just round it up to the nearest eighth. Or if the diameter is 2.36 inches, round it to the nearest quarter inch, round it up to the nearest quarter inch. So if you're between here and here, round to an eighth. If you're between here and here, round to a uh, round to a quarter. That's that's why I spec that out. Because if you go to a service center and ask them for a two and one eighth inch diameter rod, they're probably not going to have it. They might have a two and a quarter, but not two and an eighth. Does that make sense? All right. Now the capacity. So we have a VRN is V times FNT times AB. Okay. Now I'm going to do this math for you in the slides, so I kind of want to show you what's going on here with the math because I don't want you to see like, where the where the hell is Dr. Mike coming up with all of this. Okay. So first off, okay, V is 0 0.75. Because we're talking about a rupture limit state, we're talking about, um, you know, basically the rod snapping in half in, in tension, like rupturing in tension. So, V equals 0.75 is a bit more appropriate. Remember we use a V value of 0.9 whenever we have yielding, a V value of 0.75 whenever we have fracture and things like that. Okay. Now, that's V. What about F and T? Well, F and T, remember, I showed you that table last time. It was in Chapter J of the spec. Well, Chapter J of the spec um, tells us what our nominal tensile strength is. It's really a bolt table because it's looking at group A, group B, group C bolts, which we'll talk about today. Uh, and then uh, if you look at the bottom, any other threaded part, which is really what we're talking about, the F and T is 0.75 FU. So what we have here is we have... 0.75 times 0.75 FU times AB. Okay? So, a couple other things. Let me show you, so, uh, or a couple other things. We don't have to worry about the slenderness limit. The slenderness limit is not an issue because we're talking about threaded rods. Threaded rods are inherently slender, so like they, they're kind of made to be slender. So as a result, we really don't need to worry about that. So we don't apply to uh, we don't apply the L over R limit. And so we really only have one limit state. It's not like regular tension members where we have a gross section yielding, a net section fracture, a block shear rupture. All we have is this. Okay. Now let me show you. Sorry, let me show you what I'm going to do with this equation. All right. If I wanted to write 0.75 as a fraction, what would that be? Three quarters. Okay. Now, to be clear, one of these is our fee value, one of these is our reduction for FU. So what do I have? I've got three quarters times three quarters times FU times AB. Right? So what is that? Is that 9 over 16 FU AB? Everybody okay with that? Let me go over here because I feel like I'm going to get crowded over here. So VRN. And everything I'm 
I'm writing up here on the board is in the slide, so it's not like I'm, I'm showing you anything that's not there, is 9 over 16 FU AB. So far so good? Now, um, the area of the bar, the threaded rod, threaded rod bars are about that big around, samurai sword or lightsaber, what's the area of that going to be? Pi over 4 times the diameter squared. This time that actually is the area. Remember when we did the area of the bolt and I said pi d squared over 4 sounds good, but it's not. This time it actually is because here's the bar, samurai sword, what's the area? So that's 9 over 16 fu and then pi over 4 db squared. Is, is everybody okay with that? So could I write that as 9 pi over 64 fu db squared. Is that okay? And so that's CRN. So what I'm then going to do is I'm going to say, okay, VRN, that's got to be greater than or equal to our load, right? So what I can do is I can set this equal to the load. And then just solve for the diameter. And that tells me the minimum diameter I need to use. And it's really that simple. So all I'm going to do is rearrange this. So what do we have? We have PU times 64 over 9 pi FU equals DB squared. Take the square root of the whole thing. And what do I got? So DB minimum is... What is that? Square root of 64 is 8. The square root of 9 is 3, so 8 thirds <laughs> times the square root of PU over FU times pi. That's it. That, that, that's all there is to it. So if you look at this next slide, it looks like there's a lot going on, but there really isn't. It's just me plugging this stuff in and I'm solving for the diameter. That's it. Okay, so everything that you see here is just that, okay? I just think sometimes it's a little easier to walk through it together so that you see what I'm doing. Um, I know that, that engineers love algebra, so I just, I'm just kidding. Or am I? I don't know. Um, I just wanted to, to go through and, and walk you through that exercise so that when I have this expression, I'll just plug it in here. Where the hell did that come from? Well, it just it's just me making it a little easier. So again, with this expression, the phi value is built into it. The 0.75 FU is built into it. So it's really just a nice plug and chug, simple expression. Sound good? All right. So if you know that, if you understand that, let's look at this problem. Okay, so if I have a, a suspended walkway that's six foot wide, I have a four and a half inch thick reinforced concrete slab. The rods are spaced 20 foot longitudinally, and I have 100 PSF uh, live load applied to this floor system. And we'll assume that it's already been uh, reduced, so we've already had live load reduction. So we don't need to worry about that. And I want to determine how big around those rods need to be to safely support that walkway. And I designed this problem because it's reminiscent of the Hyatt City or the Hyatt Regency Kansas City walkway collapse that uh, that we discussed last time. Okay, so this again, I don't really think that the design is that hard. Uh, I designed this problem to really sort of test your understanding of loads and tributary area and things like that. Um, that's going to be sort of the the important part of what we're talking about here. So I'm going to give you all a set to jot that down. Let me pull this out. Here's example seven. So we have a live load of 100 PSF. We have a four and a half inch thick RC slab. Slab. 
Um, the walkway is six foot wide, and the dimension between rods is 20 foot. Okay. And the other thing that we know is we're dealing with A36 steel. Okay. Now, if I'm in design mode, I need to know, well, let's look here. This is what we're at. All right. Now, could somebody tell me one of those parameters really, really easily? Like, PU, that's a function of all the structural analysis we're about to do. What about FU? 58 KSI. It's 58 KSI. Why is it 58 KSI? Because it's A36 steel. So this right here, we can handle that. Now, if we want to get super, super technical, we're actually not in table 2-4. Um, if you go to that, that, um, that table, we're actually in table 2-5. Because table 2-5 is the spec for plate and bars. So we're in the threaded, the rod uh, uh, specification. So if you actually turn the page, uh, it's table 2-5. But it's, it's the same quantity for FU. Sound good? Does everybody have their AISC 15th edition steel construction manual? All right. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to look at this from, you know, plan view. So. How's my drawing? Is that pretty good? Or is it like creepy? Oh. Oh. Is that okay? I mean, I, I wouldn't want that staring at me in real life, but right now it's okay. <laughs> but you get what's going on. All right. So if I look at this walkway like this, what am I going to see? Well, I'm going to see a walkway that sort of, we're going to assume like it goes on forever, right? And I know that this dimension is six feet. That's how wide the walkway is. And sticking up at me every 20 foot long center is going to be these threaded rods, right? So I'm going to have a threaded rod like that, and like that, like that. Does that make sense? All right, let's pick a threaded rod. Let's just pick this one. And if I've got floor loads on the system and I'm trying to determine how much load is on a given bar, maybe I ought to, I don't know, sketch out the tributary area for that bar, right? So what would the tributary area for this rod be? Well, it would be halfway over to this rod, halfway over to that rod, halfway over to that rod, maybe, I don't know, something like this. Would you agree with that? So, help me out. The tributary area What's the count going to be? What's the width? What's the width this way? Feet. What's the height? Three feet. Three feet. So 20 feet. Three foot is 60 foot squared. All right. 
else. I good? Now, I propose that this rod is going to have live load on it, being represented by that 100 pounds per square foot, but it's also going to have dead load on it. The dead load being the weight of a four and a half inch thick concrete slab where concrete weighs, I don't know, about 150 pounds per cubic foot. That's not exactly feathers, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to handle each one separately. I'm going to do the live load first. How would I determine the live load on each rod? Keep in mind, I don't have to worry about live load reduction. So because my letters kind of look the same. Up here, that was supposed to be a lowercase p. This is a big case p, but uppercase p. How would I do that? The U times the tributary rate. Yeah. yeah, so the pressure load, so a 100 PSF times 60 square foot. So there's 100 pounds per square foot of line load placed over that walkway. And that rod is responsible for 60 square foot of that walkway. So 100 pounds per square foot times 60 square feet is 6,000 pounds or 6 kips. Is that a fair assessment? Okay. Now, that's the live load. What about the dead load? I'm asking you, how would I determine the dead load on each rod? I want somebody to tell me. Now, the area times the unit weight would give me the, that would be the pounds per foot if it was a beam, okay? Now, let's think about it a little more simply. Let me see if I can draw this on this um, image up here, because I'll do my best. So, That rod is responsible for all of that concrete. So let's keep it basic. How would I determine the weight of that concrete? On the volume, like the, the area, the tripped area, times the thickness, and then times the Exactly right. I know that the concrete weighs 150 pounds per cubic foot. So tell me how many cubic feet is in that little area. And how would I determine that? Well, the dead load is 150 pounds per cubic foot times that volume. And what is that volume? 60 square feet times the thickness, 4.5 inches. But I got a problem with units because I got to convert that inches into feet. Exactly right. Does that make sense? Did I do that too fast? The what? Yeah, yeah. So it'd be it would be the twenty times three. Yes, I just I could have done that just length times width times height, and it might actually have been clearer, but I was lazy. I'm sorry for that. But it wasn't a mistake, so it doesn't go on the mistake counter. I think I'm doing pretty good in here for mistakes. All right, anybody got a value for me? 3375. 3375 what? Pounds. Pounds. Do I have a second on that? Mm -hmm. So 3.375 kips. And now the problem becomes pretty boring because therefore I can determine PU as 1.2 P dead plus 1.6 P live. So 1.2 times 3.375 plus 1.6 times 6. And that equals what? Thirteen point six five kips. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. 
So now I can plug it into my magic box formula over here that already accounts for phi, because remember our loads are factored, and this builds in our resistance factor. So all we have to do is just plug and chug. Therefore, dB minimum is 8 thirds. times Fu, or over Fu times pi, so 8 thirds, couldn't see, I got a number for me. Zero point seven three inches. Now, are you going to go to Home Depot or to Huntington Steel or to a service center and ask them for a point seven three inch diameter rod? What are you going to ask them for? Three quarter. Three quarter. So, therefore, use three quarter inch diameter. easy, isn't it? Like once you get the loads, it's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> All right. Any questions? That's exam one. That is it for exam one. Everything here on out is exam two. So that's that's the cutoff. I will not ask you anything about what's moving forward on exam one. That doesn't mean we're not covering it. We're still going to move on. So, all right. Sound good? All right, so let's talk about uh, bolted connections. We have one of two types of, of connections that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, in structural steel design, that is uh, connections using bolts or structural fasteners, I guess might be a, a good way of putting it, and then connections using welds. Now, am I leaving one out? I mean, what else have you ever seen used in structural steel design besides bolts and welds? Rivets. Rivets. Why am I not talking about rivets? Okay. There's couple reasons why I'm talking about rivets, but the biggest was we don't use them anymore. Um, we don't use rivets for large-scale structural applications anymore. They're unpredictable. By unpredictable, I mean it is difficult to come up with a means of calculating its capacity. So how do you design? They're dangerous. Have you ever seen rivets installed in, in large-scale structural applications? You have to heat them up until they're red hot and then strike them. Um, they're labor-intensive. Whereas with a bolt, <laughs> so we just don't use rivets really anymore. There are instances as a structural engineer where you need to rate using rivets. And uh, that in order to do that, you just compute the capacity. And the models that we use are pretty simple and pretty conservative. And you can learn them in about five minutes. So we don't really talk about them in here. So you just... That's why I don't talk about them, because you'll never design any new structures with them in your careers. And rating them, you'll look up a capacity and move on. Sound good? I just wanted to throw that out there. Now let's talk about bolted connections. Um, now, what I have here, first off, let's talk about bolts. Um, now, the arguably the two most common types of bolts that we use in structural engineering applications today are A325 and A490s. 
Now, the manual references A307s because A307s might be used for secondary members and things like that, but they are not commonly used for structural applications. They're just weak and they're not very, very, uh, they're just not very effective. Um, the difference between A325s and A490s is A A490s are just a bit stronger. Um, so you kind of need to know how to assess both of them because it's sort of like, here's the way it works. A3, A490s are more expensive, but as a result, you can use less of them. So what one do you use for a given application? Well, it depends on the project. It depends on the price of the bolt at a given time. But A325s and A490s are the most common one. Now, when you look at the head of the structural bolt, you'll be able to tell what ASTM classification. First off, when I say A490, I mean ASTM A490. Anybody know what ASTM stands for? American Society for Testing. Right, y'all remember that from CE321? If you haven't had CE321, you'll become familiar with ASTM standards quite, uh, quite uh, in depth, right? Sieve analyses and cylinder tests and things like that. You were performing according to ASTM standards. So, this is just the ASTM standard for each of these, um, for each of these classifications. Now, I'm curious. Uh, I'm, I want to see if anybody uh, has an idea. If you look on the bolt, let's take a look, look at this uh, A490. Um, if you look at this bolt, there's an A490 that tells you the ASTM classification. That LE, what's that LE stand for? I'm curious if anybody has an idea of what that LE is for. Yes, I mean lithium energy. Lithium energy. No. <laughs> Less efficient. Less efficient. <laughs> no. If you were buying a bolt and you you were responsible for designing a connection, you were relying on that bolt, you would want to know two things. You'd want to know what ASTM specification that bolt uh, adheres to. What else would you want to know about that bolt? Who made it? Who made it? That bolt was made by Lejeune. LE, that's their symbol for, for uh, manufacturing. And then you've got uh, new core and Delta and all, all these other different bolt manufacturers. That's what that is. That's the bolt manufacturer. That's who made it. So you learned something. Okay. Let's talk about bolts. Um, uh, A325 and A490 are commonly available in bolt diameters ranging from one and a half or from a half to a one and a half, usually in like eighth inch increments. Um, the common sizes that we use in structural engineering are three quarters, seven eighths, and one inch. So most of the problems that we'll do in here will will use those diameters. And if you notice, we kind of been doing that in in the tension member. Uh, so we, I mean, how many problems did we do in class where we're looking at three quarter inch diameter bolts? It's like very very common because that's a very common bolt diameter. Now uh, here's something I want to get out of the way right now. Um, if you open your manual and you look at bolt uh, classifications, particularly with capacity, you will not see a lot of reference to A325 or A490. Instead, you will see reference to group A and group B and group C. And so let me explain what that is. Later on, we're going to be talking about the different types of bolted connections. And so the two main ones we're going to be looking at are bearing type connections and slip critical connections. Slip critical ones are a little unique because you actually rely on friction between the plates to generate some capacity. Um, as a result, there's oodles of different ways that you could install a slip critical connection. There's actually different specialty bolts that you can use. They exhibit the same material properties as an A325 or an A490, but they're actually different bolts, so they have different classifications. As a result, there's oodles of different bolts that behave like an A325, but that don't actually comport to that specification. So what we do from our perspective as structural engineers is all those bolts, we just lump them into what's called group A. And all the bolts that behave like a 490, we just lump them and call them group B. Now, if you're actually on the construction site and you ask the contractor or the foreman for some group B bolts, they're going to look at you like, what? Because they don't really exist. It's just taking a bunch of different classifications and lumping them into groups that have the same mechanical properties. Okay, does that make sense? 
Now, group A and group B exist. There is also a group C. They're very rarely applied. They're like, for instances, where you have super high seismic demand. They're, they're pretty rare. Um, we, you'll never really use them in most typical applications, and we'll never really reference them in any of our problems. I just wanted you to know that they're there. We're really just going to sort of uh, ignore them and, uh, and move on, because, again, they're, they're pretty rare. Um, this is the anatomy of a bolt assembly. I promise you I'm not going to make you memorize, you know, what's the shank and what's the grip and what's the, the head and the length and all that. I'm, I'm really, I'm not going to do that. Um, but I do want you to just have some general understanding of what a bolt assembly looks like. And so when I say a bolt assembly, I'm talking about the bolt, the nut, and the washer. Okay, and so that's, that's typically what we're, we're installing in structural applications, one bolt, one nut, one washer. Um, and so uh, there is, um, there, I will say there is something that is kind of important with uh, bolt assemblies, and that's when you're shearing a bolt, do you shear through the shank or through the threads? And whether or not you're shanking through the, the threads or, 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 or shearing through the threads or the shank defines how strong your bolt is and ultimately how many bolts you need for a given connection. We don't really need to uh, uh, worry about all the terminology. I want you to have it so that you understand it, but I'm not, I'm not one to make you memorize stuff like this. Okay, now, how does a bolt work? How, how does, what are we talking about here? Well, I've got plate A and plate B slapped on top of one another, and I'm sticking a bolt through them, and I'm yanking on them. So, oh God, this is hard. Please bear with me. I'm going to do my best, okay? So let's see. I'm never good at stuff like this. So we have, we have a plate, we have a plate, um, let's see. How do I do? good? Okay. So what I'm doing is I've got a bolt that goes through these plates, and then I'm yanking on it. So I'm yanking on this one this way, and I'm yanking on this one this way. Something like that, right? So here's the, um, sorry, here's the bolt, plate A, plate B, step through, and I'm yanking on it. Okay? And so when that happens, there's really three material or mechanical phenomenon that are going on that, that affects our strength, okay? So if I'm taking this bolt and this plate, I'm yanking on it like this, okay? So what can happen? Well, number one, the bolt could fail, right? I'm yanking it, I could shear the bolt right in half, okay? That would be a bolt shear failure, okay? The second thing that could happen is, okay, so imagine that I, so think about it like this. Imagine that I have a bolt made out of, you know, diamond or vibranium or, you know, super strong steel, and then I've got plates that are made out of plated, right? And so I yank on the plates, and it's not the bolt that's failing, but it's the plate that's failing. The bolt is bearing on the plate, and so the plate itself is experiencing failure. Okay, we call that a bolt-bearing failure. There's really two different types of two different ways that can happen, and we'll look at that later. So when I when I yank on a bolted connection, either the bolts can snap or the plate can fail. Okay. Um, if I am accounting for friction between plate A and plate B, so I got the, the bolt going through, and I got friction. The friction force that develops is also something to be considered. So when we look at slip critical connections, we're going to account for that friction. There's a reason why. You would account for, or you, where you would need a slip critical connection, and reasons why you wouldn't, and, and we'll go into that later. But those are really the three phenomena that we're after. And if you look at all of the different ways that it could fail, well, here's a single bolted joint, kind of like what I drew up here. So I'm yanking on it. I can have fracture in the net section. That's kind of like what we've already done before. I can have gross section yielding. That's what we've already had before. Um, I could actually shear the bolt. That's something we're going to look at later. 
Um, when we talk about bearing failure, these are uh, what we're going to be talking about soon. So this is like the plate failing or the hull elongating or the hull tearing out. This is kind of like block shear, isn't it? A little, little bit like that. The equation that we use is kind of akin to block shear uh, as well. Some of these other ones, they theoretically could happen, but very rarely do they do. Like we never really worry so much about bending failure because usually that's what's going to, uh, to govern our behavior. But these are a number of different things that, we, that could happen. We could also, what if we're not shearing the bolt? What if we're tensioning it? What if we're yanking on it like this? Like we have a hanger uh, assembly, so the bolt could fail in tension. Okay, so based on this behavior, what, what we do is we classify bolted connections into two categories. Um, you know that, uh, that rule or that saying, it's like, what was it? All squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. You know what I'm talking about? So all bolted connections need to meet bearing type connection requirements, but not all, but not all bearing type connections need to meet slip critical requirements. So uh, bearing type connections are, okay, you have a plate, you've got a bolt going through the plate. Um, what happens in a bearing type connection is that the load is transferred between the members by the plate literally bearing on the bolt. So here's the plate, here's the plate, and I yank on it, and so it actually bears on, you know, the bolt comes into contact with the plate. So in a bearing type connection, there's only two ways it can fail. Either the bolt shears in half or the plate fails under bearing. But with a slip critical connection, we have to meet those two requirements, but we also account for the friction between the two. So all slip critical connections need to meet bearing type uh, requirements, but not all bearing type uh, connections need to meet slip critical requirements. So the slip critical ones are a bit more stringent. So does that make sense? Okay. Let's talk about this failure. So again, this is bolt shear. Um, this is a bending failure, but, but again, we, we really don't have to worry about that so much, so we're really looking at either failure of the bolt or failure of the plate. When we have a bolt shear phenomenon, we have to consider two different uh, 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 events, or two different uh, uh, variables. One is, do we shear through the threads or do we shear through the shank? And then two, how many shear planes exist, okay? And with this bolt, I'll go ahead and tell you there were two shear planes because it sheared through the bolt two different slices. And we'll, we'll, we'll show you that in a second. Okay. Now, before you start writing down a bunch of equations, writing down a bunch of notes, with bolt shear capacity, I'll go ahead and tell you, you pretty much don't have to do any math. And I'll show you what. First off, if I'm looking at a single bolt, the shear capacity of that bolt is as follows. So, like I said, for a bearing type connection, there's two ways the connection can fail. Either the bolt fails or the plate fails. So let's look at the bolt first. The shear capacity of a single bolt is the, is the area of that bolt multiplied by the nominal stress. So it's a pretty simple formula like what we've been dealing with before. Um, the V value is 0.75. So the big two questions we have to ask is how many threads are in the shear plane? Uh, or, or are the threads in the shear plane? Sorry, are the threads in the shear plane? And how many shear planes uh, do we have to account for? So when I ask whether or not the threads are included in the shear plane or not, I'm really talking about this. So which bolt do you think is weaker under bolt shear capacity? The one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the left. Shearing through the threads means you're shearing through less area of the bolt. So it's like the weak link in the bolt. Um, now let me ask you a question. If you're designing a connection and you don't know whether or not the threads are going to be in the shear plane or not, what would you assume? Assume the left, right? Assume that they are, right? So that's something to keep in mind. There are going to be problems in this class where I just say design uh, assuming group A bolts. And I'm not going to say whether or not the threads are included or excluded because you need to know that if you don't know, assume they're included. Okay? Now, the way that we term that is we say the threads are included or the threads are excluded. That is a lot. That's word salad. That's a mouthful. So we use a pretty simple notation. So if I say group A dash N, I'm saying group A bolts where the threads are included. Group A X, the threads are excluded. 
See, I'm, I'm, we're really creative as engineers. We come up with this. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's beautiful in its simplicity. Now, I want you all to go to table J3.2 on page 16.1-1.9. This is the same table we looked at earlier today when we were looking at um, we were looking at, at, at threaded rods. Now, if you look, so there's A307, which we don't even make a distinction whether or not the threads are included or excluded because they're so weak anyways. But look at group A, okay? Now there's two rows. Now with the two rows, it doesn't matter which row you're looking at because the tensile capacity doesn't change. I mean, with, with tension, we're yanking on the bolt. We're not shearing it. So it doesn't matter whether the threads are included in the shear plane or not because we're not shearing it. But if you look at group A, the two rows, over here on the right, we have one row where it's 54 KSI and one row where it's 68. So look at the row where it says uh, 54. Group A bolts when threads are included in the shear planes, not excluded. So the first row is when the threads are included. The second row is when the threads are excluded, right? So if the threads are included in the shear plane, the shear capacity is lower. Make sense? That, and that's what's going on there. Because the threads are included, we have a reduced shear capacity. So we have group A where the threads are included, threads are excluded. Group B where the threads are included, threads are excluded. And that's reflected accordingly. Okay? So that's pretty straightforward. You know, you can just look up those quantities. What about the second question? What about whether or not the, sh what about shear planes? What I mean by shear planes is that dependent upon your connection, it's possible that there's more than one plane in the bolt that is experiencing shear. For instance, if I look at the connection up top, there's only one shear plane, right? So I'm only, so let's say that's three quarter inch diameter bolt. So the area that I'm ripping through is pi over four times three quarters squared, right? But on the connection on the bottom, I'm actually having to rip through twice as much material. So you could think that that bolt on the bottom, it's actually sort of twice as strong. It's not like the bolt itself got magically stronger. It's because in order to snap that bolt in half on the bottom, I have to actually rip through more bolt. There's more area to rip through. Does that make sense? Well, if that makes sense, I want you to turn to this. And this is where we're going to call it. 7-22. This is our first, I think, like, foray into a full-blown design aid. Um, now, I'll be honest, this design aid, there's really nothing special with this design aid. You all could probably generate this on your own with half an hour in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. It's really not that difficult. Now, there's a lot of material condensed into this aid. So much so, see my little star? You know what that little star means? You should put a tab on that. We're going to use this pretty, um, pretty regularly. Okay. Now, look at the top. So the top lists the nominal bolt diameter, right? So you can see whether or not what bolt diameter you're looking at. And then uh, you have the bolt area. So you don't even have to compute pi over 4 d squared because it does it for you. Look over here on the left. We have group A, group B, group C. We're past that. N X, N X, N X. So you can delineate whether or not you're looking at a group uh, A threads included, group A threads excluded, group B threads included, group C threads excluded. Look at the loading. What does we think the S and the D means? What does that mean? It means that the bolt is either in single shear or double shear. Make sense? So if you had a three-quarter inch group A threads excluded single shear bolt, that capacity is 22 and a half kips. You see that? And so if you have a connection that's got nine bolts, and you know the capacity of a single bolt, just multiply by the number of bolts. Boom, there's your bolt shear capacity. It's that simple. There's really nothing magic about this. It's just doing it in Excel, reporting your answers to three significant digits. If you look at if you look at any group of values and you compare the thread or the single shear versus double shear, it's just double, right? Like 17.935.8. It's just 
double shear, just double capacity. Right? Now, one last thing that we're going to call it, we are using LRFD. We use the blue numbers, not the green numbers, or the non-shaded numbers. So, um, and we will always use the blue or non-shaded numbers throughout the semester. Sound good? Next time we're going to look at bolt bearing, which is this, the different ways that the plate can fail in a local fashion. Because either the bolt's going to fail or the plate's going to fail, and these are some ways that the plate fails. We either stretch the hole out like it was a piece of Play-Doh, or we actually have sort of like a mini block shear failure, and we'll look at the capacity on how to compute that next time, and then we'll start doing some examples. Sound good? That's all I got. Did I pass the sign sheet around? I did not. Man. Well, here. Pass that around real quick. That's all I got. I'm sorry. I, I went on about not having a mistake counter, and then I forget to pass the sign sheet around. Come on.